Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have back in the studio, Mark Fisher. Mark, welcome. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you. What I'd like to cover today is you've left the Church of Scientology. You got all your stuff from the unit base and drove away. Right. Now, the story doesn't end there. In fact, it goes on for years and years because the Church of Scientology is never going to let you go. Right. Tell us what happens in the events that lead to Las Vegas and you being spied on for many years by the Church of Scientology. Okay. Well, I mean, we le I left September 15, 1990 from uh, you know the, the int base, and I had no idea where I was going to go. I had a car and I had some money. And so I just drove around the Pacific Coast Highway and, you know, up to San Francisco, around to Las Vegas, and then down to San Diego and tried to, you know, I, I got some help from um, uh, my ex, my now ex-wife's uh, family. They helped me out a little bit because I had no, no place really to go. I'd been, dis I'd been disconnected from my dad for many years, and so I didn't feel safe going to him right away. And so I, I went there and they helped me out a little bit. But then uh, shortly after I was there, I got contacted by um, a, a you know, a former senior messenger who also had left about a month before I did, and that was Janice Grady, uh, Janice Gillum. She was the daughter of uh, Peter Gillum and, and Yvonne Gillum Gents, um, and she was one of the original messengers along with her sister Terry uh, Gillum, who, who now is Terry Gamboa. And uh, so they had also left maybe about a month before I did. And Janice and I had always been very close when we were in the Sea Org because uh, my, my ex-wife and her were fr really good friends. And as a matter of fact, uh, her husband, Paul Grady, and, and Janice and I and my, my ex-wife, we shared a two-bedroom apartment together uh, for quite some time uh, as Sea Org birthing. Uh, when we were out at the end base. But anyway, uh, they had left about a month before I had. And when I heard that they had left, that really gave me sort of incentive to going like, you know, I'm not crazy because, uh, you know, a lot of the times when you're thinking about leaving, particularly when you're in a senior position, you've been there for a long time, uh, you know, you think that you're crazy, that you think there's something, something must be wrong. It's been drilled into you that you're responsible for your condition. And therefore, you know, you must have overage or you must have committed some crimes against Scientology because that's why you want to leave. But re in reality, what was happening was my logical common sense was overtaking my feelings of brainwashing that were trying to keep me there. So basically, you know, I, I, I just, you know, decided, no, I, I, this is crazy and I need to listen to, you know, the logical part of my brain and get the hell out. Uh, I tried to, uh, you know, I wanted my ex, my wife to come with me, but she wouldn't. She'd basically been turned against me. So I, I just had to make the choice of staying and going crazy or leaving and, and gaining some sanity. And hopefully, you know, uh, at the time we thought, well, L. Ron Hubbard will be back at some point because we, you know, that's what really what we believe. And so we thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll just leave, and when he comes around, he'll get things sorted out like he always did, you know. Uh, but anyway, um, I was out down in San Diego, and I got a phone call from Janice Grady, who called um, my ex-wife's father's house looking for me. And uh, so we we hooked up. I hooked up with her and her husband, Paul Grady. They were up um, in uh, Central California. And then uh, she was in touch with Terry, her sister, Terry Gamboa, and uh, her husband, Fernando, who were in Miami. And they had left maybe three, four months before that. And so basically, make a long story short, we decided, well, let's go into business together because we had no idea what we wanted to do. Uh, so there was a, there was a uh, former Scientology uh, public person who had been in the mortgage business uh, in California for some time. His name was Steve Goldfield. And uh, he offered to help us because he was opening up a new uh, mortgage company in Las Vegas if we wanted to relocate to Las Vegas. And in 1990, the end of 1990, uh, Las Vegas was boomtown. I mean, that was where the economy was really taking off. I mean, it was it was featured on the cover of Time Magazine, and that, that seemed to be the place to go. So that's what we did. We all ended up uh, moving to Las Vegas uh, around December of 1990. Mark, uh, a couple of things. First of all, David Miscavige is obviously consolidating his power mm -hmm. at this time. And, and that means he has to get rid of a lot of people who are a threat to him, right? Right. Doesn't it occur to the guy that a lot of hyper-talented, very strong, very motivated Sea Org executives, he's thrown out of the church? Right. I mean, I mean, this is he doesn't stop to think these people could be formidable enemies if they don't like me. Well, he, I don't think that he thought of that right away because if he did, um, he would have had to sign confidentiality agreements like they ended up doing later on. I mean, I didn't know. I never signed anything. You know what I mean? I can speak out all I want. They can't sue me or, or take any money from me like they did Debbie Cook and some of these other people. I mean, that that was all thought of after the fact. The fact, you know, we were like some of the first people to leave and that, you know, uh, we, we just gone. So he didn't have that protection. We, we, we went into... Um, 
into business in the mortgage business. And shortly thereafter, we, we had a guy show up who who, um, who we hired on at the uh, mortgage company who at the time we had no idea who he was. His name was Dave LeBeau. But and we later found out that he was a Scientology, you know, private investigator uh, who was sent in to spy on us. And that was based off of which we found out years later, you know, Marty Rathbun mentioned the fact that they had spies following Pat Broker. David Miscavige liked the information he was getting on that. And so he thought, well, we got this group in, in Las Vegas, so we may as well do the same thing there because he didn't know what the hell we were doing. Look at the mismanagement of David Miscavige. He shoots first, right? Mm -hmm. Shoots people first. Then he has to figure out what to do later. And this is just a bad idea. Instead of you know dealing with top executives by giving them a severance package, helping them, he shoots all you people. He you he he physically attacks, right, right? right? And then he has to figure out how to clean up the mess and handle it. So instead of using ARC, which you know is a teaching the church affinity reality communication to get to get into communication, he he doesn't do anything that's even related to Scientology. What he does is said he sends in people to spy on you as his way to handle you, right? Well exactly. And the thing is is that you know we all we wanted to do was get on with our lives. You know, we were done. We were finished. You know, we we had we did not had no desire to go back. Um, and all we wanted to do was start making some money and, you know, m you know, creating our lives. I mean, when you're leaving, when you're getting ready to leave or say you want to leave, they tell you, they tell you stupid things like, oh, you know, you'll only get a job at McDonald's and you'll only get a minimum wage job. And why would you want to go do that? You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's really, you're told that, you know, I'll never forget Mike Sutter and Marty Rathbun and, and these people telling me that, you know, when I wanted to leave, you know? Um, and, uh, so, so that, that, that was going on and, and they're basically saying, oh, you know, you're, you're just, you know, you're, why would you want to do that? And they, they don't realize that, you know, we have abilities and, uh, you know, we do have, although we, the hardest thing was, is that we had a track record of success and production in Scientology in the Sea Org, but that was hard to translate that when I was 32 years old into a resume that we could then go out to get a job. If anybody tried to verify my resume anyway, Scientology wouldn't even acknowledge it. You know, if somebody tried to send a verification of employment or contact them, they wouldn't even acknowledge it. You know what I mean? And I wasn't the only one who ran into that. A lot of people ran into that. So, so we're basically starting over. I'm 32 years old. I, I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. And that's where the idea of going into business together and working together seemed to make sense, okay? Seemed to make sense for, from a survival point of view and also where we felt like we could, you know, back each other up. As a matter of fact, you know, immediately, you know, we shared, we had a two-bedroom apartment and uh, uh, Terry and Fernando lived in one bedroom, Janice and Paul lived in the other, and I, I slept on the couch in the living room. So it was like, you know, we were, it was still in that mentality of, you know, let's try and save money and try and get on our feet and see what we can do. Part of the legacy of Sea Org is a lot of people who are financially broke in middle age. Right. They have to start over. Right. And it seems it's better to do it with other former Sea Org members than to try to, you know, go out on your own. And that's what you guys were doing. That's exactly right. So, you know, we started working for the Steve Goldfield and basically got in different positions. You know, I was in, I was a loan officer in, in sales along with Fernando and Paul Grady and, and Terry and Janice Moore. Were, uh, they more went towards the uh, administrative side of the mortgage uh, business at the time, right? And the thing is that we then started, you know, we reconnected with other people too. So like the, uh, there was a guy named Kenny Lipton who had been a senior executive in Scientology and the CRM. Uh, Commerce Messenger Organization and the Sea Org for many years. He was the, the the brother of Peggy Lipton, the actress who was married to Quincy Jones. Well, he's out too, and so we grabbed him and invited him to come to Las Vegas. And before long, he moved here as well, and he became part of our team. And um, over the j just as an aside, over the like the next three or four years, whenever people left the Sea Org that we got a hold of, we actually were a sanctuary for them to come and get work. Uh, Jeff. Walker, who had been the senior uh, CS uh, International and the senior CS flag, he had blown at one point. We were able to get a hold of him down, uh, I think he was in uh, Louisiana at the time, and Janice got a hold of him, and we got him, and he moved to Las Vegas and came to work with us. And then uh, a, a couple um, of, uh, of senior executives who'd been around for a long time, uh, Cheryl Detchef and her husband, Gene Detchef, same thing. They all came to Las Vegas, and, and we, we built up a team of people that, you know, we wanted to provide for them as well as, you know, earn money for ourselves. So I could see, you know, a little bit, you could say, well, you know, from David Miscavige's point of view, 
well, why are all these people forming up there? You know, I mean, they got to be, you know, you know, plotting against me to take back over Scientology when all <laughs> we were trying to do was make a living and and survive. You know I mean? Yeah, and your old friends who worked together in the Sea Org, did it ever occur to you that David Lebeau was spying on you? Well, here's what happened on in regards to that. Okay, so we started that up, and we had no idea you know, what, what was going on. Like I said, we just wanted to get on with our lives. Meanwhile, we find out years later what that on, from David Miscavige's point of view, I mean, they're trying to get the IRS tax exemption. And in 1991, right after we, we had left the time magazine article cult of greed comes out, you know what I mean? The Richard Behar article. Yeah. So they're like, they're like, freaking out over that you know what i mean and then also here's these senior executives who we have no gag orders on who are out there who could speak you know what i mean and, and speak against us and uh, i remember um i'm not going to mention who but somebody was contacted by nightline when when david miscavige was going to be on nightline just to you know to to speak and then they declined uh from our group but basically you know we were i guess we were considered somewhat of a threat so and lo and behold, this guy shows up. You know, we were just hiring people, you know, to be loan officers, and this guy shows up and he gets hired. Um, and uh, he just was a nice guy. He'd, he'd relocated, he said, from California, and uh, he was married, but his wife was staying in LA for the time being until he got set up and that type of thing. You know, we just were naturally friendly. So he became our friends, friends with us and started, you know, we go to dinner, we go to lunch, we talk to him, that type of thing. How you doing? What's your background? And we were, we weren't shy or, or about telling people that we used to be in Scientology. So, you know, we started telling them, oh yeah, we used to be in Scientology. Oh, what's that like? Or what is that? You know? And so, you know, several of us disseminated to him. We gave him the Dianetics book and we started talking to him about Scientology and he was showing an interest in that sort of thing. So um, we, we all lived in the same apartment complex and over time, I moved out of the living room, the one apartment, and I got my own apartment, as did Kenny Lipton. We all were living in the same apartment complex. Well, Dave LeBeau, he, he then moves into the same apartment complex, and the apartment complex has a racquetball court, so we were played racquetball together. You know what I mean? He just, he just sort of ingrained himself as just sort of a friend, you know? And the fact that we could talk to him about Scientology and, and disseminate to him, I don't think that really showed any kind of threat, but, you know, now, you know, as you know, well, no, Jeff, you know, Dave LeBeau says, I'm a Scientologist, you know what I mean? He's, you know, and in the lawsuits and stuff, I'm a Scientologist. Well, he wasn't a Scientologist, we found out when he first started with us. How was he as an employee? Did he do a good job as a loan officer? Well, he, he you know, he did the same work we did, but, uh, you know, I talked to Janice, you know, recently, and she said he'd, he'd never closed any loans. I mean, he, he, he hardly ever got anything done in terms of, you know, business, you know, um, but somehow he had a form of income and you know and, and that's always a question well you go oh well my my wife inherited money you know she's got money and she's taking care of the kids in california and she came up a couple of times for a weekend to visit you know but but that was basically it i i lasted about almost a year in las vegas um september of 1991 okay that's when i you know i you know, at the time, the mortgage industry, you know, we weren't getting paid very much and we were struggling, I mean, individually. And that's a whole nother story. I'm not going to go into the details, but basically I was broke. I had nowhere to go. And I got to the point where I, I had no, I, I had to have certain loans closed in order so I could pay my rent, you know, or I was going to be out on sure. the street. And, uh, you know, anyway, to make a long story short, I, I, I blew up. I, you know, at one point I, I just blew up over somebody who, who, who was handling one of my loans and, and uh, they didn't do it good job in my opinion so I got upset and that's one of the things we had to learn when we were in this uh, when we were now working in our own business is that you can't get upset you can't yell at people you can't I mean that's not that's not common business practice in the real world you know whereas in Scientology you're upset about something you get upset well you know we, we had other owners that were part of the company who were not former Scientologist. And when I did that, that was it. I was out the door. I was like, you hit the road, Jack. You know what I mean? You know, we, we don't tolerate that sort of thing. And so I basically didn't know where I was going to be going. I'm glad you said this be for this reason. One, uh, it shows that you, you can take the person out of Scientology, but it's harder to take the Scientology out of a person. You had to learn a hard lesson, right? Well, exactly. And here's the thing. I, like I told you in the last interview, I wasn't known for yelling when I was in the Sea Org. You know what I mean? I was the Mr. Good Guy, you know, that type of thing. But the necessity level for me at the time was the fact that I was going to be out on the street. I had no place to live and I needed money. So I resorted to, you know, a last resortist. I, I, I got upset at this person who had messed up something. And then that was that I learned a hard lesson, just like you said. So I basically was out the door. So I'm sitting in my apartment thinking, you know, what am I going to do? Well, this is where... Uh, 
a friend, I, I met a guy who's still my, one of my lifelong friends. Um, he was a business owner in, in Houston, Texas. And uh, this is where I told you that, that we were going to get a little bit into sex and Scientology into this yeah. radio interview, okay? In Scientology and also in the Sea Org, sex is basically, they have a very puritanical view towards sex, uh, different uh, viewpoints towards, uh, you know, people who are gay or people who are lesbian or, or that type of thing. And I'm sure you well know this. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard, you know, preached that they were aberrated. There was aberration there and that, that, that there was something wrong with that. You know what I mean? Meanwhile, yeah. I find out after we leave, we read the Russell Miller book. We read about L. Ron Hubbard's history. This is before the internet. We find out he was married to two women at the same time. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, he, he had a, he had kind of a sordid history himself. And, and it reminded me of like, I was thinking like, well, you know, I used to have to deal with L. Ron Hubbard's family when I was the corporate liaison office in, in, uh, in, um, the Sea Org. Arthur Arthur Hubbard got assigned to the RPF, and I had to really? I had to I had to myself and Jason Bennett. We had to filter. Mary Sue would write to him on a routine basis letters, and I feel bad about this, you know, in hindsight. But at the time, we were ordered by David Miscavige read the letters going to and from, and if there's anything really screwy, let me know. You know what I mean? So we had to read the letters that Mary Sue wrote to Arthur and the letters that Arthur wrote back, and he he was really really in trouble at the time i mean as a person i'm not going to go into details but there was a lot of stuff going on with him and and i was thinking to myself you know l ron hubbard's supposed to be you know the expert and of virtue on all dynamics in scientology and in life and the second dynamic that for those that don't know, don't know has to do with sex and family and meanwhile i'm thinking he doesn't even have a really good relationship with his wife or his kids so I, at the time i was thinking Okay, well, maybe I'm missing something here. Well, Mark, let's stop there for a minute. Okay. Now, you knew that Mary Sue Hubbard had been arrested and, and, and went to prison. Right. Didn't that bother you that, that she had been basically a criminal who had been thrown out of the church? Well, exactly. Well, see, she had gotten out of jail at that point, and then she was living in the, in the house in Las Villas, as we later found out. But basically... She was just, you know, pushed to the side, moved to the side. I mean, you know, the whole viewpoint towards Mary Sue Hubbard from David Miscavige and, and management was she was she was the head of the Guardian's office and she was the one behind Snow White and she was the one, you know, so basically she's persona non grata. You know, the only reason we're keeping her aside as a kept woman over here is because she's still alive and she's still married to L. Ron Hubbard and it would be very bad publicity if he divorced her or she went, you know, you know what I mean? It was just like basically keep her keep her down. Well, let's stay with Mary Sue Hubbard just for a minute because there's not a lot known about Mary Sue Hubbard. Did you ever meet her? No, I did not. But you had to read letters that she sent to her son Arthur when he was on the RPF. Correct. Just like, you know, you know, security reads letters to and from all Sea Org members, but specifically because of the family nature and I was trusted, and, and Jason Bennett, we were trusted, we were in the corporate liaison office, we had to read those letters. Now, did you know at the time that Quentin Hubbard had killed himself? Yes, th that that had happened earlier. That had happened in 1977 or 78. We didn't know why, but I mean, it just was, you know, it was something. I'd met Quentin Hubbard on a flag tour, you know, when I lived in Washington, D.C. years before that. But uh, no, I mean, I, I knew that, but I didn't know why. But, but going back to Hubbard, you know, he's supposed to have the answers to life and the universe, and yet his family life is far from perfect. Right. How does it strike you between being in the Sea Org and, and idolizing Hubbard and being out of the Sea Org reading about him. Well, it, you know, the thing is, is when I started reading, what, what really turned, you know, what, this is before the internet, you know. So we got a hold of Barefaced Messiah, which was the Russell, Russell Miller book, and we read that. We all read it. And I started reading stuff that I knew was to be true because, you know, he interviewed former messengers who had left, and I knew some of the stories that were being told, and so I had a tendency to believe it. But then he went into L. Ron Hubbard's history, and what really turned my stomach were two things. Number one, I find out all of a sudden, well, he was married to two women, and he had one of his kids, he, he kidnapped one of his kids while he was married, you know, and, and I didn't even know that he had another kid. The only kid that we knew, kids that he knew, we knew he had were Diana, uh, Quentin, Suzette, and Arthur. And, and, and I knew Nibs, L. Ron Hubbard Jr., I knew that because, you know, he had, he had uh, you know, he'd spoken out and, you know, and, and that type of thing. But I didn't even know he had another daughter or it really turned my stomach because I was a student of history was, you know, and this is where I realized that L. Ron Hubbard turned on anybody that was ever an ally of his because I read about in the early 50s, he had, I'm not sure who it was, but, you know, he got money to set up the different foundations and stuff like that. And somehow somebody, you know, 
whatever, he had a falling out with them. Next thing I know, I see letters, because Russell Miller had letters, where L. Ron Hubbard wrote to the, the McCarthy, Joseph McCarthy, Senator Joseph McCarthy, and the FBI saying, this guy's possibly a communist. And, and anybody who knows history, and I mean anybody who knows history, knows about the McCarthy hearings and about what a black mark that would be against you if you were even suspected of being a communist or a commie. L. Ron Hubbard, this great being, turning on somebody who was helping him and turning him over and saying, this guy, this guy right here, he's a communist and you should be investigating him. And that's evil in my opinion. That changed my viewpoint towards L. Ron Hubbard big time just from reading that book. When you're in Scientology, you know, it's very repressed and, and, and that type of thing. And I, like I said, I was a virgin until I was married. And I, my only girlfriend I ever had was my wife. And that was the only person I'd ever been with. So here I am in Las Vegas in 1990, right? And all of a sudden, you know, I'm out in the real world. And people at work, you know, we're working with people that are not, that are not Scientologists. All of a sudden, they're like going, hey, come on, come, come join us. We're going out and having a drink. And we end up at a strip club. You know, at a topless bar here in Las Vegas at a strip club. Yep. And I'm like going, ooh, I don't know if I should go in there. You know what I mean? I'm, 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 my whole repression thing is, is, <laughs> yeah. is sinking in here, right? So yeah. so I, I go walking in there, and I couldn't believe my eyes, okay? I'm, I'm a single guy. I'm 32 years old, only been married once. And I'm looking, and these girls are gorgeous, first of all. And they take their tops off, you know what I mean? And, and it's yeah. legal. I, you know what I mean? There's nothing illegal about it. There, you know, it's yeah. legal and there's lots of people and they're all in there enjoying it and having a good time. And I'm thinking, wow, this is actually pretty cool, you know? Um, so anyway, what, what happened is, is that I met this, this gentleman from Houston, Texas, who ha happened to be, I met him through a real estate agent in Las Vegas because he was one of the originators of the high class, upscale gentlemen's clubs that started up in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And he was the founder, one of the first guys to start one of the biggest clubs in the country. As a matter of fact, he had been featured on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And, uh, you know, at his clubs in Houston, Texas, uh, something like 18 or 20 of his girls had been centerfolds for Penthouse Magazine and another two or three had been centerfolds for Playboy Magazine. So it was like, it was a very, you know, very connected, very, very, uh, you know, lucrative business, obviously, right? I met sure. him through a real estate agent here in Las Vegas while I was working, you know, in the mortgage company. And he wanted to find a location here in Las Vegas and arrange financing to set up a club here in Las Vegas because he wanted to expand. He loved Las Vegas. So I met him and he and I hit it off right away. Um, you know, he, he really trusted me and liked me. And there were things about, that I liked about him, his personality. He was very gregarious. He was very funny, but he also was very ethical. You know what I mean? Like he, he didn't, he didn't drink. He didn't do drugs. He, he, he just was like, to him, this was his business. And he was a multimillionaire and this was a business opportunity. It wasn't anything else. It wasn't about the sex. It wasn't about the topless girls. It wasn't about any of that sort of thing. And so he and I hit it off really, really, uh, really well to the point where I actually went down to uh, Houston in Texas to see his clubs and see his whole operation down there and um, and uh, we became friends right so I was working on hit you know trying to arrange investors for his place here in Las Vegas when I lost my job at, at the mortgage company for blowing up right so yes. first call I get when I'm sitting in my apartment going what am I gonna do I'm gonna be evicted in about five days I have no way of paying my rent what am I gonna do he calls me up. He goes, hey, what's happening? And I told him, I said, I lost my job. I'm sorry. I'm not going to be able to help you anymore and this and that, blah, blah, blah. First thing he says to me, he goes, pack up your stuff, put it in storage, come down here. You can come work for me in Houston. He goes, you can live with me until you get on your feet and you can get your own place. Wow. And, and don't worry about anything. And I did. I, I, I said, sounds good to me. You know what I mean? I had no idea what I was going to do, but I was like, okay. So I packed up my stuff. I get emotional about this because. Oh, I understand. Mark, I understand. You didn't the kindness have to help is, me. Yeah. This is the kindness, the kindness out here that Scientologists never experience. Yeah. And he did. And he's still one of my best friends to this day. But anyway, I ended up, I went down there. I, I packed my stuff up, drove down there with my car and went, moved into his house and he gave me a job. And I started working for him as the promotion and marketing manager for two of the largest topless clubs in the country. Now you can imagine that juxtaposition of being DM's right-hand man in Scientology. And now I'm the manager 
at, you know, <laughs> the marketing manager and the right hand person of two of the largest strip clubs, topless clubs in the entire country. That is just a <laughs> staggering comparison. <laughs> You, you, you know, because you told us in the last interview about how you wake up David Miscavige in the morning, sir, it's time to get up, sir, it's yeah. time to get up, to running strip clubs. But as I said earlier, and I want people to really get this, Sea Org members have a work ethic. You're somebody I would hire running a business. Right. And strip clubs are a business. Right. You know, you're running, you're running a bar, basically. And, uh, so he thinks enough of you to hire you. He does, and he knows you're a, you were a former Scientologist, correct? Yeah, I told him a little bit about that because you know I was always honest with, and open about my background. But um, but we were kindred spirits, and he liked me. So I, you know, he I went down there and I, I started doing the advertising and promotion, and that's a whole nother chapter of my life. You know what I mean? I look at it this way. I mean, at the time I was like, you know what? Who cares? You know, I mean, at the time I was thinking, you know, I was trying to get over that repression, that repressed viewpoint of like, oh my God, you know, you know. It's, you know, this is wrong and this is out ethics and it's unmoral. And I'm thinking to myself, who cares? It's a business. It makes money. I'm not hurting anybody. You know what I mean? Nobody's getting hurt here. You're making money and you're successful in uh, managing gentlemen's clubs. Is there you Right. And I wasn't called, right? being paid a lot of money, but it didn't matter. I mean, I had a great time. It was a fun job. My job was getting customers to the door. And to be honest with you, I got them using statistics and we started tracking how many people came through the door and we, you know, we tracked what our, he already tracked what his liquor, beer and wine sales were, what his, what his soft drink sales were, what his door charge were so I mean here already I realized that other businesses oh yeah they use statistics as well so you know I we, we hit it off really well that way but the, the, how, how this all came about get back to Dave LeBeau right is that yeah. as soon as I get down there I'm not down there two weeks and here comes Dave a phone call from Dave LeBeau going hey I'm coming down to Texas on business so you know why don't we get together <laughs> while you're here yeah okay so I'm saying yeah okay no problem so he flies in and he meets me he picks me up in this rented Cadillac, big Cadillac sedan, right? And I'm asking him, you know, well, let's go to dinner and let's go to lunch, you know. I take him by the club, I show him, you know, what I'm doing, that type of thing. And then uh, then I ask him, well, what are you doing down here? He goes, oh, I'm, I'm doing a real estate deal in this small town outside of Houston, and I'm down here meeting with these guys, blah, 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 right? And um, the whole time that I'm down there, you know, at this point, David LeBeau, you know, we told him our stories about David Miscavige. We told him about the abuse. I told him about getting beaten up by David. Miscavige. So he he knew, you know, we'd already gotten close enough where we were telling him what happened to us. Well, he's down there, and all of a sudden, just in the conversation, he starts asking me about what's your viewpoint towards Scientology now. And these aren't the exact words he used, but he was like, "What do you think about David Miscavige now? And what do you think about this? And what do you think about that?" And I immediately, my brain goes, "Ding." Something wrong with this guy. Why is he asking yeah. me these questions? Number one, why is he down in Houston, Texas? Because I'm I'm halfway across the country. I, I'm, I'm not. I have nothing to do with the mortgage company there in Las Vegas anymore. And so I immediately called Janice Grady uh, back in Las Vegas, and I said, you know, I think this guy Dave LeBeau is a plant. Which in Scientology terms, this is a spy. Uh, a plant is somebody who's planted or put in some location. I'm thinking this guy's a plant. I told, and I told Janice about the questions he was asking and this and that. And she's going like, yeah, well, you know, he, we've noticed some things about him up here too, but we weren't really sure. Anyway, so that, that's the, that was the first inkling we had that, you know, maybe he, you know, he was working for, some, for Scientology. When did you confront him? Well, we didn't confront him because, see, what happened was at the same time that I left to go to Texas, right before I left, Terry Gamboa and Fernando Gamboa, they were approached by these investors from Hong Kong, these really rich gentlemen from Hong Kong, who was looking for someone to, uh, to make a long story short, they offered them $100,000 a year and all expenses paid to go to Australia and find a ranch, buy it, and then uh, or rent it, and then host these guests that they were going to send from Hong Kong on horse tricks. Well, Terry Gamboa, if anybody knows her, I'm Terry Gillum, Terry Gamboa. She loves horses. She's all about horses. She rides horses. She owns horses. It's just that. When she was in the Sea Org, she loved horses. So she goes down to Australia with Fernando, and they're down there. And then we, then shortly thereafter, the same thing happens. Dave LeBeau comes down on vacation down to, to Australia. 
and he's on vacation down there. And they're going like, well, you know, he's down there with his wife, I guess, or whatever. And they're going like, well, what are you doing down here? Where'd you get the money to do this? Oh, well, you know, my wife has an inheritance. And he's asking questions about them down there. It wasn't until years later after Marty Rathbun left that we found out that this was all orchestrated by Scientology. The whole the whole investor was a was a setup by Scientology to get Terry Gamboa out of the country. And me, I'm down in Houston, Texas, because they wanted to break up our group because they at the time the IRS thing was going on and they were in negotiations with the IRS and they didn't want us somehow being contacted by the arrest to go, oh, David Miscavige actually really does control Scientology and does order into it. And Terry Gamboa, the same thing. We find this out years later. We didn't know what the full picture was until Marty Rathbun left in 2009. So in your opinion, David Miscavige was spending tax-exempt dollars to conceal material facts from the Internal Revenue Service. Not only that, they, they actually spent the money. They actually were paying Terry and Fernando to be down there, and they, they ended up leasing a horse ranch, and Marty Rathbun tells the story that they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on that just to get them out of the country. And all while they didn't or, they didn't organize me and me ending up down in Houston, Texas, you know, I later found out by, you know, you know, by listening to Marty and Mike, and also I did, I wasn't privy to what the um, Office of Special Affairs, what the or, what the policies were, and what their what their tactics were. And one of their tactics, as I found out after the fact, is was to infiltrate groups, and then somehow try and get them to break up. That's what they did with the Advanced Ability Center with David Mayo in Santa Barbara, and and Correct. it fits with what we were doing in Las Vegas. I would love to see OSA, Office of Special Affairs, files on Mark Fisher and the group in Las Vegas, because I guarantee you there's secrets there that we don't even know about yet. Now, Mark, on the last show we left off around 1993, you were working for gentlemen's clubs. Right. <clears throat> and uh, you weren't being paid a lot of money, so you wind up back in Las Vegas? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I you know, that kind of had run its course, but it really was more the opportunity um, in Las Vegas, uh, Janice and Paul Grady and Kenny Lipton had gotten an opportunity to actually buy the mortgage company that uh, that we had been working for, and so you know they offered for me to come back and and go to work for them because I actually was I actually was good as a loan officer, and they also had increased the commissions that we were going to be paid and stuff too. So I went ahead and took that opportunity and moved back to Las Vegas. You become a loan officer, and how does life proceed then? Well, I mean, I, I I got back, I moved back here to Las Vegas, and things are moving along. Dave Dave LeBeau is around, but but he's not working at the mortgage company anymore, but he's, but he's keeping tabs every once in a while, checking on things and stuff. And then shortly thereafter, you know, uh, Terry and Fernando Gamboa come back from Australia and then they get, they buy back into the, they buy into the mortgage uh, company as well. And of course we didn't know it at the time, but this is right around the time of the IRS settlement. And, um, there was no need to have a, you know, a ranch down in Australia anymore. So I guess that opportunity sort of dried up and then they came back, but you know, we were all working again in the mortgage industry here in Las Vegas at the same company at that time. And it, and uh, Janice Grady was the one who, who found out for sure that Dave LeBeau was a private investigator because Dave LeBeau was friends with another person here in Las Vegas who was in the mortgage industry. And he actually admitted to him that the reason he was there was that he was there to spy on us. And this person turned around and told Janice Grady that. And this guy had no idea. You know that we were Scientologists and like that because you know Dave LeBeau told us this thing. You know, so that confirmed it to us. But at the time, we decided that as a group, we decided that it was better to know. We didn't confront Dave LeBeau on it. It was better to know who the spy was as opposed to, um, you know, you know, confronting him and then have them send somebody else in that we didn't even know. So we sure. decided like we're not doing anything wrong anyway. So who cares? You know what I mean? So that's basically what happened. Didn't know. Did you just treat David LeBeau? To, did you just gave him like what would they call? Uh, what is it? Uh, good roads, fair weather. Exactly. I mean, he it, it was you know you were careful about what you said around him, and then before too long after that, uh, Janice had confirmed that, and the IRS stuff had happened. All of a sudden, Dave LeBeau was no longer here. He was off doing something else. He was back in California. David Miscavige, after tax exemption, kind of leaves you guys in Vegas alone. But then in 1995, Lisa McPherson dies, and that changes everything. What happens from your perspective? Well, during that time period, after I moved back to Las Vegas, um, I, I forgot to mention that I then reconnected with Vaughn and Stacy Young. I had no idea. With All of a sudden, they came out of the woodworks. I found them. Uh, they were living out in uh, Orange County down on the coast, and um, I 
Stacy had been my twin in the RPF and we were very, very tight. So I went immediately went down to visit them. And of course they were being spied on during that time because at that time they were consulting on the Fishman case that was going on and also the Time magazine lawsuit. So they were expert witnesses and they were telling me about what they were doing on that. And I wanted to stay away from that at that point in time because I just wanted to make money and you go, you know, go back to the mortgage business. So although I remained friendly with them, I didn't get involved with anything like that in terms of, uh, you know, consulting or anything like that. You know what I mean? I just was going to keep, you know, doing, you know, just acting and living my life out. But I was friends with Vaughn and Stacy, so I would see them from time to time. When they moved up to Seattle, I would visit them up there and all that. And that's where Dave LeBeau actually surfaced again because he he was up there harassing Vaughn and Stacy Young. And when I sent Vaughn Young a photograph of David LeBeau, he confirmed, he goes, yep, that's the guy. And they didn't know him as David LeBeau up there. They knew him as something else. So that's, again, another confirmation that we had that he was working for Scientology. Um, shortly after that, the Lisa McPherson thing happened. And I, I didn't know anything about the Lisa McPherson thing, but but uh, Robert Minton, Bob Minton got involved with Vaughn and Stacy Young and Stacy Young specifically. And then they, they set up the uh, Lisa McPherson Trust down in Clearwater, Florida. Um, and they had hooked up with Jesse Prince, who I, I had not talked to either in years. I didn't even know he was out. So I started talking with uh, Jesse on the phone, Stacy on the phone, and Bob Minton a few times. I talked with them on the phone. And um, during this time period, um, there was there was uh, we had somebody else that we hired at our mortgage company in Las Vegas by a guy, a guy by the name of Ferris Khan. And um, first, his wife got hired. And she actually, I was actually working together with her. She worked for me, but then her husband, they, we were looking for loan officers. And she says, oh, well, my husband would be really good for that. So then he gets hired to be a loan officer at the mortgage company with us. And, um, you know, it turns out, you know, we find out years later that he actually was another paid spy uh, to, you know, to spy on us in Las Vegas. Now, why is David Miscavige so terrified of you guys in Vegas if it's, you know, been five years after you left? Is it just his intense need to control and know? And well, we, we didn't know at the time, but it's date coincident with the Lisa McPherson stuff going on in Bob Minton because, you know, David Miscavige, we turns out, had some hands in the pie in regards to Lisa McPherson, and he didn't want... Uh, you know, he, he was becoming a target of the investigation. So having Ferris Khan there was a way of keeping track of us in terms of whether or not, um, you know, the attorneys for Lisa McPherson or Bob Minton would contact us or try and get a hold of us because he wouldn't want them testifying against us. And I, I found out later, I'm, I'm sure, you know, one of David, David Miscavige's, always his defense is whenever he's brought up for a lawsuit is that I don't control the church. I have nothing to do with it. And of course, um, you know, myself and Terry Gamboa, we could directly testify to the fact that that wasn't true. So I would imagine that's why he had he had a distinct interest in us at the time. So David Miscavige repeatedly, you know, keeps tabs on people who could be a threat to him or could testify to the fact that he actually runs the church. And he has to then play a very expensive game with spies to keep tabs on potential enemies or witnesses as you know if you prefer you you guys just want to live your life and be left alone correct and then see what happened was is that i we had no idea what was going on down in clearwater florida at the time but you know he was he was being investigated for criminal charges along with the church scientology and of course you know jesse prince and stacy young and the minton trust they were they were working together with ken dandar the attorney for the mcpherson lisa mcpherson's family and they were they were helping them and stuff. Well, I was in touch with them, and um, it wasn't until I started, you know, um, uh, becoming more and more close to buddy buddy with that that all of a sudden Ferris Khan decides that he's going to be buddy buddy with me because before that he really his attention was real more towards being close to Terry and Fernando Gamboa and not so much me. But all of a sudden he's taking me out to dinner and we're hanging out together and and that type of thing, right? And his his wife actually. Is, gets pregnant and they decide they move to Phoenix because you know it looks like their 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 duty is over in Phoenix. He's only down there a short period of time when all of a sudden he comes back and says, you know, I I, I really want to work with you guys in the mortgage industry and and I'm going to stay here and you know my wife's going to stay down there while she has the baby and I'll be up here. And um, it was during that time period that I left the mortgage company that the other Sea Org members you know were involved with because I basically wasn't making enough money and I that's a long story but I, I just wanted to break off and I was being offered a position in another company 
more money, so I decided to leave. Well, he then follows me over to that company again, just like Dave LeBeau, and like, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? You know, you know, et cetera. And, and uh, you know, he starts offering me, you know, um, I'm breaking away, and I'm financially stressed again. This is another financial stress point for me. And he says, listen, he goes, I've got some work for you to do that um, you don't worry about your money. You don't worry about your rent and things like that. He goes, because I've got some work. I'm, I'm thinking about setting up a company that sells cell phone service, you know, and uh, I need an employee manual put together. So um, I'll tell you what, um, how about I hire you to put this employee manual because you're really good with, with paperwork and things like that. And uh, you set this thing up and I'll, I'll take care of it. I'll pay you to do that. I said, okay, fine. I mean, I had nothing nothing to lose on it. I had no suspicion that anything was going on. So I started uh, putting together this employee manual for this cell phone company that he was going to set up. And I traveled down to Phoenix to see him, et cetera, et cetera. All during this time, I'm talking with Jesse Prince and Stacy Young and, and the people in the Lisa McPherson Trust and just, you know, finding out and, you know, what's going on. What are you guys doing down there? Um, and, of course, because this guy's my friend, he now he knows about us and Scientology and all that. Well, I start telling him about who I'm talking to and what I'm doing. I ha I have no way of knowing that this guy's a spy. So I'm telling him, that, oh yeah, and he he gets he he's reading up on the internet during that time. That's when the alt religion uh, thing was on the internet. He started telling me, oh, you should read this and you should read that. And I started reading it, and so we'd start conversing back and forth because he was following what was going on in the uh, critic world, you know. And so yeah. I, that made me think that, well, he has nothing to do with this. You know what I mean? That, that he's not a Scientologist or attached in any way. Um, but anyways, uh, to make a long story short, what eventually happens is I, I'm working for him. He pays me about six, seven, eight thousand dollars to do this employee manual over. It takes, takes me about two, three months. Meanwhile, I'm getting my feet wet and getting going where I'm going to work uh, commission only uh, in the, in the um, mortgage business. Um, during this time, um, I did voice the fact that, hey, you know, let's, I want to go down and visit uh, Jesse Prince and Stacy down in the, in Clearwater at the Lisa McPherson Trust. This is 2000. This is like February 2000. And um, I mentioned this to Ferris. He goes, hey, yeah, let's go down. That'd be a great trip. Let's go do that together. So I make arrangements to go down and visit them down at the Lisa McPherson Trust with Jesse. Well, I, we didn't find out. I didn't find this out till years later after Marty Rappin left. But what happened was is that David Miscavige got wind of the fact that I was coming down to Clearwater, and he was convinced that Bob Minton and Jesse and Stacy were going to convince me to testify against him, you know what I mean, in the thing. And I had no yeah. idea. That wasn't why I was going down. I was going down to visit them and see what was going on. So they came. He, the orders from DM, to, according to Marty Rathman, were keep Fisher out of Florida. So they come up with this whole ruse of sending me on this trip to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico with Ferris to meet an investor for the cell phone company. Oh, geez. Yeah. And it's, it's this whole detailed thing. And all of a sudden, you know, Ferris is saying, hey, Mark, listen, that same weekend, I've got this investor that's from overseas that's going to meet us down in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And it's an all expense paid trip down to the, you know, Mex Mexican Riviera. And I'll pay, you know, we're going to pay for it, you know, the whole bit. And we should go do that rather than going down to Florida. I'm going like, yeah, but I've already committed to my friends that I'm going to go visit them and all that. He goes, look, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. He goes, you know, we could, we could go into business together, et cetera, et cetera. I say, okay, fine. We'll go down to, to Mexico instead. So I, I let Jesse and Stacy know that I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to, you know, put off the trip, but that I'll be coming down at some point in the future. Again, this shows the, uh, internal apparatus at work there's there's no amount of money they won't spend to protect david miscavige to spy on you to, to you know to know what's going on and and really uh within context david miscavige was very embroiled in lisa mcpherson case at one point he was facing potential criminal charges so they're at osa spy central with david miscavige running it they're keeping tabs on everything and everybody that could be a threat to them well and not only that like you had mentioned before they're using parishioner donated money to keep track of me but not only that i'm sure that eight thousand dollars or whatever i was paid by ferris i'm sure that was all that was all money given to him by scientology do you know what i mean and sure, and, and, and you know and i had to do i declared it on my taxes the whole bit and we, we did the whole tax thing and all that but still it was like you know, that's money that, you know, they, they use that to pay me. And then um, then also for the trip down to, to Mexico, you know, we then fly down to Mexico. We're down there four or five days and we don't see any investor. The investors didn't get there to the last day. Well, 
during that time, you know, Ferris and I had become buddy buddies when we were in Las Vegas. So we would go and I, I like to hang out the strip clubs. I mean, I had friends that were strippers. I had experience working in the strip clubs and I knew the whole business and all that. And he liked it too. So, you know, we'd be go running around and having a good time in the strip clubs. So what do we do when we get down to Mexico? First thing he wants to do is he takes me to a strip club down there. And while he's down there, I find out after the fact in 2009 when Marty leaves is that he's down there surreptitiously videotaping me getting lap dances or table dances from uh, these Mexican strippers down there and sends them back to David Miscavige, who then later, you know, they go, well, great, we got the goods on this guy because see, th their whole thing is the old school blackmail, like the 50s and 60s blackmail. Like people really care that a single guy is in a topless club getting a, getting a, a table dance or that a single guy is out with a girl somewhere having a good time uh, or that, that they pry into your sex life or into this and that. I mean, they think that they, they can use it. Now, I still, I still, it did work for me against me because I still was a little bit afraid. Like, you know, I didn't want this stuff known by my family. You know what I mean? My mother was still alive and, and my sister was still a Scientologist in good standing, a public Scientologist. And she had a relationship still with my mother, even though I was declared suppressive and my mother was living in Las Vegas and I helped to take care of her. I had basically an unspoken understanding with my sister and my mother that I never told my mother what happened to me when I left Scientology. And I did that because I didn't want to ruin her relationship with my sister who was still in and had had a kid and was married and stuff. So, so th they had some leverage over me. It wasn't so much the fact that I was getting a table Table dance from strippers. It was more the fact that I didn't want to ruin my relationship with my mother's, uh, with my sister. Yes, yeah, Scientology is very much into blackmail. The whole idea of blackmailing, getting the dirt. Now that it's very well known that you know that this goes on, it's really to the Church of Scientology's disgrace that they'll still use blackmail. Probably one of their bigger problems with the IRS is the use of tax exempt dollars that are not spent in the public benefit. Right. This is not a Scientology. Uh, this is not a church. The Catholic Church, I'm sure, does not go out and get information on their critics to try and silence them. No, no, not at all. Now, now, just to just to discriminate between two things, uh, a church can spend money on security. It can right. spend money on investigation. You know, the, the legitimate, straightforward thing. Uh, say, if someone's trying to, you know, blackmail a bishop or a cardinal, right? There's a fair use of money to, to handle things internally, but to run an intelligence bureau that does not benefit the church and, in fact, is done only to inure to the benefit of David Miscavige's paranoia, I think this, the Squirrel Busters clearly shows where they crossed the line. That was more overt out in the open. My harassment was I didn't even know I was being harassed. You know, after the Puerto Vallarta trip, then there was all sorts of things that happened that, that turned out that Ferris Khan was buddy buddies with people I was doing business with. And next thing you know, I don't have a business relationship with them anymore. Uh, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of examples of stuff like that that I didn't even realize until after Marty Rathbun told me in 2009 that they had somebody take me to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico on a bogus trip. And I went, that's my friend Ferris. I just talked to him on the phone before I talked to you, Marty. I had no idea. We went on the trip in February, two, March of 2000. And I didn't find out till August of 2009 when Marty Rapp and I finally talked to him after he left. It was a, it was a really innocent conversation. All I did was I emailed him because he said, you know, anybody have any problem with me, you know what I mean, contact me. And I, I had a problem with Marty because I didn't like the way that, that he had treated Vaughn bon Stacy Young. I didn't like the fact that they'd sent Dave LeBeau in to harass us when we weren't doing anything. And I did have a problem with him. So I just wrote to him. I said, look, Marty, I'm glad you're out and all that. But he goes, you know, what the hell did you guys, why were you guys interested? in spying us in Las Vegas. It made no sense. What, what We were just trying to live our lives. And then he wrote back to me and he goes, well, we actually, we, we had somebody there, you know, you know, and there was interest because of the IRS and all that. He goes, but we also had somebody there around 2000 as well. And I went, what? We didn't know anything about that. So then I got him on the phone. And that's when I talked to him on the phone and he said, oh yeah, we tried to keep you out. You were going to come down to the Lisa McPherson Trust and DM said, keep you out of, keep you out of Florida. And we had a guy, I said, he goes, I don't even know who it was. They ended up taking the Puerto Vallarta. And that's when I went, it's my friend Ferris. I just got the phone with him. And is after, after that Puerto Vallarta trip. And I never went, I never went back down there because then all of a sudden Ferris Khan started telling me, 
Jesse Prince is being investigated for criminal activity. You know, Mark Bunker, who was down there, he got he got attacked in Chicago by some cops that were doing security. He goes, you don't want to get involved with stuff like that. And I went, yeah, you know, I, I actually start was starting to make some good money in the mortgage industry on my own. And I always I was starting to really, really do well. And I went, you know what? I, you're right. I'm going to stay away from that. So I, I, I steered clear of that. All during that time, like Ferris Khan is encouraging me, like, let's travel overseas. So he goes, where, where do you want to go? And I said, you know, I've never been anywhere. And he goes, well, you know what? You know, we like the strip clubs. He goes, you know, we could either go to Amsterdam or we could go to Thailand. And then I said, well, right, let's go to Thailand. I've never been to Thailand. So we go down to Thailand. And so we went down there and, and I'm sure he you know, sending back reports and photographs of me down there. But it just was all this whole sort of stuff. Like he's, he's my buddy. He's taking me around. We traveled, we traveled up to Portland, Oregon to see, um, uh, to see some friends. And then we actually went to go visit my stepmother. I mean, all these things, he became a very integral part of my life uh, to the point where, you know, my, I, I get financial tips from him. He taught me how to how to invest in the stock market. And I call him up if I was trading in a stock. I mean, this guy was like my closest friend. And um, it got to the point where I even, he wanted to borrow money from me. He asked me to borrow uh, $3,500 because he needed to pay the IRS some money. And I said, well, I don't want to loan you any money. He goes, why? And he goes, because you're a friend and I don't want to have to collect from you. Well, he then goes on, look, I promise you I'll pay you back. I said, look, finally I gave in. I went, look, I'll loan you the money. But I said, you got to pay me back by the end of the year. I'm never going to mention it. But if you don't pay me back by the end of the year, then I'm going to start collecting. And then what happens is, of course, he never paid me back. And then when I started to try and collect, he started going on and on about like, well, I paid for that trip to Puerto Vallarta and I paid you to, to do the employee manual. Well, it turns out he got paid that money from Scientology. So you basically have a complete scumbag. He's spying on you for money from Scientology, and then he borrows money from you. Now, did you finally confront him on being a spy after well, yeah, talking exactly. to Marty? Well, see, see, here's what happened. Like, you know, we were so close. We would talk two, three times a day, and we would talk about – you know, what was happening, like when Anonymous was happening, you know what I mean? And, and when all this other stuff was going on, I mean, there was another incident that happened in, I think it was around 2006, where um, an ex Sea Org member named Mick Winlock had set up a, a group online on Yahoo for ex Sea Org members where we could converse. That was the first group we ever got, I ever got in touch with, where we actually reconnected with people that I hadn't seen in years. And it was through that group. Well, they, they had a reunion here in Las Vegas and we hosted the reunion here. And about, you know, 12, 14 people, you know, showed up here and, and that type of thing. Well, guess what? Ferris Khan's, you know, asking about it and this and that. Wasn't, wasn't a week after that happened that all of a sudden I'm getting a phone call from my boss at work, my uh, the, at the mortgage company I was working at, at the time, saying, hey, you know, I'm getting these phone calls from somebody from the People's Commission on Mortgage, you know, you know, Honest Mortgages, you know, like this total bogus yeah. commission on human rights, right? He goes, and they're, they're, they say they're investigating you for mortgage fraud. And if anybody in the mortgage industry in Las Vegas and in Nevada knows, the only people that would investigate you would be the state of Nevada Financial Institutions Division because any complaints would be filed with them. It's all regulated by the state of Nevada. So he's going like, this is really, sounds really bogus. And I went, oh, wait a second here. Did they give you a phone number? He goes, yeah. So I told him, I said, listen, I think it's Scientology. And that's when I had to tell him about my, my uh, involvement in Scientology. I said, we just had a little reunion here thing, and they're here trying to intimidate you. So I called the number, and of course, it was just a voicemail. So then I, I, I contacted a couple more of my business contacts. I said, you know, you might be contacted by this Citizens Commission on Mortgage, blah, 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 blah. And I said, if they do, I just want you to know that it's probably Scientology. And I told them about my history in Scientology. Lo and behold, 20 minutes later, this guy that I did a lot of business with, he gets a phone call. He goes, I just got a phone call from those people, and I told him to shove it. I said, okay, good. So I had no idea where this information was coming from. So, But it turned out that that was Ferris. Ferris was was feeding this information to OSA, and then they were they were doing what they were trying to do to back me off, you know? Um, so so he was involved with all of this different stuff to the point where he also was involved with sending information to my sister uh, about me that, that then they used that when I started speaking out, I went to an anonymous an anonymous demonstration in LA with the first one where second one where Jenna Miscavige Hill came out and spoke out about uh, disconnection. I went to that one. I said, you know, she deserves our support. And I said, I'm coming out of the shadows and I'm going to go and I'm going to go to this demonstration. I went with some friends. And that was the first time I actually actively was out 
protesting with my face. And we took photographs. And there's, a, there's a photograph of me in front of the, you know, the building in Hollywood with with a sign where there's a sign saying Mike Rinder Blue and so should you. And, yeah. and I was out there, you know, with Tori Christman and and um, different friends. Mark Headley was there. I, I met Mark Headley and hadn't seen him in years. And so I was out there. I was becoming very visible. Next thing you know, my mother gets a dead a package from my sister. But it was actually postmarked from L.A. Even though my sister lived in Florida, it was postmarked from L.A. saying, I don't like the people that Mark is hanging out with. And you you need to, you know, you either need to choose between him or me. Trying to blackmail me to shut my mouth through my mother's relationship with my sister. <clears throat> now, Mark, this is amazing for s several reasons. So Ferris Khan is acting like you're from, but he's backstabbing you, right. trying to hurt professionally. Right. Now, I was at that same demonstration. I remember you there. I met you briefly. I think Tori introduced us. Anonymous was a very, uh, the anonymous protests were, was a very watershed event because, absolutely. yeah, oh, absolutely it was because a lot of that, a lot of it allowed uh, independent Scientologists or former members such as yourself to come out. It gave us the power. I all of a sudden, we couldn't believe the numbers of people that were showing up on these videos we were watching. And I was talking about Barris Khan about it. We couldn't believe it and it actually made it feel safe that you could go out and speak out. Yeah, and that's one thing Anonymous should be acknowledged for is they, they blew a hole open in the time-space continuum. Absolutely. Through which the independents could come. And even as begrudgingly as the Indies, you know, later acknowledged anonymous at the time, I was arguing that people like Marty, like Mike Rinder, should get a free pass. Right. And we're getting into a little bit of tribal politics here, but I'm I'm an old guard critic. Right. And I thought anonymous was tremendous. Mm -hmm. You know, and I went to the protests. Yeah. And when you started to see people like you, former church executives, this was a big deal. This had to really worry David Miscavige. Because the last thing he wants are the camps to talk with each other. Right. He doesn't want Olgar talking to Seorg, talking to Anonymous and comparing notes. So what is Ferris telling you? Is he tell is he telling you that Anonymous is a criminal organization? Yes, started, you know the, the the enemy line that Scientology was putting out saying they're they're terrorists. He goes like, you know, you should watch this video about them. They're terrorists. They're hackers. They're this. They're that. And I'm going like, I don't I don't know anything about that. Plus then Scientology's attack on me. You know, like when they've tried to dead agent me since then, since I've been speaking out, it's like he's a member of Anonymous, as if, as if there's a membership to it. And, <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's yeah. the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard because it wasn't a member of Anonymous and nobody's in the member of Anonymous. I just happened to go to back up that one protest, you know. So what they did was they what happened was they used my sister, who was a public Scientologist, who had disconnected from me years before and hadn't spoken to my father or my brother years before and they used her to try and pry, pry a wedge between my elderly mother and me and it didn't work they sent all sorts of blackmail material that ferris khan had gathered up and stuff that i had posted on the internet to try and basically blackmail me and my mother went this has nothing to do with me she didn't understand it she she wrote back to my sister saying this has nothing to do with me you know you you know why are you why are you putting me into this position and sure enough my sister disconnected from from uh, her mother that all happened and then it wasn't until like i said marty came out that i finally confronted ferris khan um, what happened was, is that I found out and I, I knew immediately it was Ferris and I went over with Marty and then Marty goes, I don't know who it is. He goes, let me check with Mike Grinder. So I sent a photograph to them and they checked and they went, we never met the guy. We didn't know who it was because it was all set up by Linda, ha Linda Hamill, they said in the office of special affairs. Um, but that they had this guy, you know, and so, but they did confirm, I mean, I didn't, they didn't know I'd gone to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. I mean, I'd never told them that. And they're telling me that right. I went to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico on Scientology's time. I'm going like, there's only one person who organized that, and that's Ferris Khan. I mean, it was just a, it was easy to deduce. So um, shortly thereafter, they put me in touch with Joe Childs um, of the Tampa, uh, St. Petersburg Times, now the Tampa Times. And then they came and they interviewed me for the Truth Rundown series. They came to Las Vegas. They interviewed me. They did a video. And then I came out like in November of, 2009. Now, I didn't, all during that time, I didn't tell Ferris Khan that I, that the jig was up, that I knew what was going on. So, um, it wasn't until the night before the articles were going to hit the, the new, the internet and the newspapers, I finally called him up and I said, you know, you may, you may want to check the internet tomorrow. I left a message because there's going to be an article uh, that you're going to be interested in. And sure enough, you know, <laughs> the next day he read it and then he tried contacting me right away. And sure enough, as soon as he contacted me, he 
I, I he wouldn't he wouldn't acknowledge anything. He's going like, oh, that's all a bunch of crap. And he goes, he goes, it's all your fault. In other words, he tried to turn around like it's your fault, meaning it's my fault yeah. this all happened. I said, Ferris, I just asked him a simple question. I said, were you or were you not paid by Scientology to spy on me for the last twelve years? And he wouldn't answer yes or no. I'm going like, Ferris, I'm going to repeat the question to you. Were you or were you not ever paid by anyone, anyone at all, attorneys, anybody, to spy on me and to send reports back? And he still would not acknowledge that. And it, it got to the point where I just said, look it. I goes, I don't have anything to do with you anymore until you acknowledge the fact that, that, that you accepted money from them and that you were actually spying on me. So that was the last time that I talked to him during that time. And it wasn't until a couple years later that uh, uh, Tony Ortega posted my story and the thing about Ferris Khan on his blog that Ferris actually responded as a, as a commenter on, on Tony Ortega's blog. It was only up there for one day, but he, he, he went on and on about saying, oh, this isn't true and the da da da. And then Tony Ortega, I gave him Ferris's phone number and Tony Ortega tried to uh, call him and he, wouldn't, he answered and then he wouldn't, he wouldn't take the call. Um, and then shortly thereafter, all of his comments were taken down. And then he tried and contacted me finally the uh, last time about maybe a year ago, a little over a year ago. He sent me an email. I'm in Las Vegas. He goes, I really need to see you. This was like not quite a year ago. And, you know, I went, I have no reason to see you. You know, and he goes, why? He goes, it's really important that I see you. I said, not until you admit, you know, that you were spying for Scientology. And he goes, he goes, hmm. he goes I, I, am not, I can't talk about that. And then I said, well, listen, let me tell you the reason why I'm not going to speak to you. And that's when I, I told him the story about my sister um, uh, who had passed away uh, about a year and a half before that. And I found out about it after the fact on the Internet. Our family wasn't even informed that our sister had died. Just like Alexander Jantz had been, you know, had died and, and Karen was informed wasn't even informed. We didn't find out till six, eight months after she died. And I happened to only find out that my sister died just because I was surfing the internet and I, or not uh, surfing Facebook. And I found See? somebody who, who had a friend of my sister who was out of Scientology. And I went, I saw he went ahead and I clicked on my sister's page and everybody was talking about her in the past tense. And then uh, we found, then I got put a page back and it turned out that in November of 2011, she had died of, of uh, colon cancer. She was only 55 years old. Your sister was in the Church of Scientology. As a, as a public, public individual. And she died and the Church of Scientology would not tell you she died. Correct. Her husband, who was a Scientologist, didn't even bother to contact our family. I told my brother and then my brother, he went and he, he researched and got the death certificate and then um you know i had to tell my mother which was really hard my, my sister died well this is this is so devastating and and this is what the church of scientology needs to understand this is vicious he, he it's would, vicious he wouldn't even talk to her um he she she was not a non-scientologist calling saying we would just like the details of betsy's death and also where she buried what happened you know because her family doesn't know anything about this and he he was he wouldn't talk to her. So, really? Yeah, yeah. So so that's 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 what Scientology does. So I let Ferris Khan know in no uncertain terms that you know he managed to drive a wedge between me, my my sister, and my mother, and particularly my sister and my mother. And then my sister died, and our family didn't even know about it. Of course, he's not going to take any responsibility for it. Yeah. You know, when Alexander Jensch died, Karen and I found out through the kindness of a stranger on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And for you to lose your sister. And not find out till months later. Uh, it's the viciousness of the Church of Scientology. Absolutely, and it's it's drilled in not just the staff. They, they were public Scientologists living down in the Clearwater area, and uh, and that's how they ended up. They died, and, and she never she never reconnected with my brother, myself, my mother. Uh, when my dad died in 1996, she didn't even bother going to the funeral. You can only understand it, I guess, if you're inside under the intense pressure because from the outside it doesn't make any sense and but that's in the nature of a cult who would who would join jonestown right mark fisher thank you for being our guest for surviving scientology radio this is jeffrey augustine thank you for listening